Broadcast episode 23, I think. Don't uh, get mad at me if I'm wrong. I have a wonderful guest here. This is the world renowned, world famous, maybe sometimes infamous, infamous if he's criticizing yeah. your audio or video uh, expertise. Or snake oil accessories in the audio field. Snake, yeah. snake oil accessories in the uh, audio field. Um, this is uh, Dr. Mark Waldrip. Welcome to the show. Welcome to. Thanks, Aaron. It's a pleasure. <laughs> uh, we're here live <laughs> from uh, the Batcave. Uh, if this is the Batcave, my office of the last 23 years, 22 years, whatever, here <laughs> at uh, Cal State University of Dominguez Hills. Oh, man. Yeah, I want to thank you, for first of all, for taking the time to do this interview. I know you're a busy man. Uh, you guys can't see it, but there is tons of projects <laughs> just to the ceiling that he has to grade. I don't know why. He uh, loves to just torture himself like this. I'm a procrastinator <laughs> like everybody else. You know, get the homework in. When you got 42 students and, and 20 projects on each one, it's a lot of grading, a lot of listening. So. Does does the procrastination work out better when you're a teacher rather than? A no, it doesn't really. <laughs> I, I did one semester actually a while ago. I missed the grading deadline and yeah, and I had to fill out I don't know a hundred incomplete forms, which is when you had to do it by hand rather than online. So. I learned my lesson. I, I, I clamped down big time at the at the end of the semester for getting okay. grades in on time. But yeah, it's a responsibility. That's my half of the equation. But what students don't realize, it takes me longer to grade the papers than it does for them to basically study for and take the test. So yeah, it's, it's, that's not a it's not a cakewalk on either side. I don't en I don't envy your you your position or your responsibilities because I have enough. It's fun. <laughs> I, I like teaching. I've been, I wouldn't keep doing it if I didn't didn't feel like I was making some kind of contribution for. For those people that are motivated and interested, and, and, and then, you know, those that stay in touch saying thanks so much. We've got a guy that was out there, you know, last year at the Home Depot uh, Center shooting It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, we had the... Uh, George Flores was here, and he's yeah. a former student. So. Yeah, we did have that former student, and uh, that was cool. Some of the students got to go to the uh, StubHub and see the shooting yeah. of Always Sunny. So thank you for that and uh, other opportunities you've uh, given us. And... Um, I do want to talk about, I will talk about audio and, you know, some stuff, um, but I do, I do want to start from the beginning. Okay. Okay. The beginning, before you were Dr. AIX, before you were Dr. Mark Waldrip, we're talking way back, back in the time, uh, what, what do you say, um, would you say you come from humble beginnings or a more privileged upbringing as a child? You know what I mean? Uh, I do know what you mean, and and you know I, I relate to that in in the following fashion. Usually, I I, uh, I talk about um, having visited my father's parents, my grandparents, okay. in a city in in uh, called Tunica, Tunica, Mississippi. Oh, wow! Tunica, Mississippi, <laughs> which is just south or a little ways outside of of uh, Memphis. Okay, and. Tunica, Mississippi was uh, a, an exceedingly poor um, town. Um, it's not so much anymore now. they got river gambling, I understand, but I haven't been there in 40, 50 years, something like that. Uh, and then I grew up, my father was a pilot for General Motors, flew, uh, flew wow. executives around after being a, a pilot in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the news, I think it was 1965, 70, or 67, something like that, uh, it was it was either Dan Rather or uh, or Walter Cronkite something. They had a, a a census stat. Okay. And they said the most affluent, highest per capita income, mm -hmm. and the least per capita income. Guess which two cities they were? Tunica, Mississippi, was at the low end, <laughs> and Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, was at the high end. Really? Oh, that's when the plant was still there. The well, GM yeah, plant. General like Motors and still, so forth were going gangbusters, and, and the executives. That, that, you know, I went to high school actually with the CEO of General Motors, Dawn. Oh, wow. So she was in so, my, my class. So, yes, this was a, uh, a privileged. Uh, okay. It was tough to get that as a, as a, you know, to feel that growing up there. It meant this was just life. So, so until you actually then move out of that environment or go to, you know, work in a restaurant and, and when you're a teenager and, and talk to people in Kego Harbor, Michigan or Pontiac or other places. 
didn't really realize it, but the fact is, yeah, I grew up in an, an upper middle class uh, environment, neighborhood, um, fairly affluent, mm -hmm. white, yes. um, you know, and, and, uh, and that was until, until the reality hits, until you mm -hmm. leave. You leave from the bubble, the nest, the Yeah, you the start shell. to find out what the, what the rest of the world is like, <laughs> and, and, and that not everybody had those kind of, of opportunities as they were growing up. No, okay. Because the reason I asked that was because when, you, when you're talking to us in class and you're telling us all the things you've done and accomplished, you know, your, your academics alone, accomplishments or achievements or, you know, that's... You know, that's not. I like to, going to school. Yeah, you like going to school. You told us if you can be a professional student or you can stay in school, do it as long, long what's, as you what's can. What's better than that? I mean, unless you're a sports hero or a rock star or something. Yeah, I don't know. But so, going to school and learning new stuff was really a turn on for me. For sure. Yeah. So you started out in um, Michigan, but your 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 parents' parents were your dad's parents were my, down in my dad's parents were down in Mississippi. Yeah. Uh, he went to school in Arkansas and Mississippi as a kid. Mm -hmm. Um actually entered the military when he was 16. What well, branch? Air Force. Cool. So he was a bomber pilot of B17 when he was 18 were, years old. They were doing it. Yeah, they were dropping they were bombs definitely on dropping, people. <laughs> they were definitely dropping bombs. And then there. after the war he came to to Detroit. Okay. Uh, um with my mom, they had met down in the southwest, I think Texas or someplace like okay. New Mexico. Okay, right, near a base or something. And and he ended up flying uh, what are airliners, basically, for the executives of General Motors. So he was, okay. a, he was a pilot for their so own private airline. By being within their proximity, he was able to tap into some of that affluency. You know? Well, look, a, a, a yeah. pilot is a, is a pretty well-paid uh, position, I think. and, and uh, I don't know if it still is. I know some, it depends. Yeah, if you're an airline pilot, I mean, you can make yeah. a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. It's like driving a bus in the sky, and, and the same for him. But, mm -hmm. you know, and we weren't in the in the CEO, crazy, you know, mm -hmm. money kind of category, but we, we did well enough to yeah. to to, uh, to have a nice house in the suburbs. And, okay. And, you know, it didn't work out too well because my folks got, got ill and mm -hmm. passed away when I was a young, very young man. Uh, like younger than Like 12. 15. Like 15? Yeah, my dad died of cancer when I was 15, and my mom wow. five years later. So Of the a, same type or just a different? Different type of cancer. He had melanoma, she had uh, brain cancer. Jeez. So yeah, it puts you on a different track. It did certainly for me. So at 15, where did you go from there? Because that's not so nice. Well, way, yeah. 15, we moved from a bigger house to a littler house, you know, not too far away, so that the uh, family could... Could finish the same high schools. So you're like, who was taking care of you at that point? Well, my mom. Okay. But fifteen. Mm -hmm. Then my mom died when I was twenty. Okay. And so you know we went through high school, and I had started college. My older brother was off to college, and okay. my younger sister then uh, was in college. My younger brother, who I have a, a brother who's nine years younger than yes. me, he went out with my aunt and uncle after after my folks passed and uh, lived in Colorado. So your your younger brother went to Colorado. Yeah, he was six at the time. So. He just went with the uncle? Yeah, he went with my aunt and uncle, my mom's uh, sister. Okay. So there was a lot of connection to the family into, into Colorado, for sure. Very close with them. Wow. So, yeah, it's um, you know, rolling the dice in a, kind of a bad way, but uh -huh. it does change your perspective. And and while you know, a lot of my contemporaries' friends have to deal with their parents getting sick, and you know, at this point in life, I've been through all that. It was 50 that years was ago. Yeah, that's that's crazy, um, and especially you know, still young age. Uh, so fifteen, your dad, and unfortunately twenty, your mom. And then were you had you started the trip into college at that point? Like yeah, at I twenty. Was, I I went to the University of Michigan uh, out of high school. Okay. Uh, for um, what was I there? Two years. I went, and then um, to get what? I was studying architecture at the time, design and architecture. I had nothing to do with music in, in any of my high school mm -hmm. uh, classmates who would think, yeah, I was into music and, yeah, I played in the band. And, but you, you know, weren't taking guitar, it seriously but I wasn't at that really, point. wasn't a career path for sure. Okay. I wanted to be an architect, and and, uh, and then after my my folks passed away, I did not go back to school. My mom died in, in the fall of 1973. Okay. And so I went, uh, I said, with my best buddy, back there who wanted to be a Formula One race car driver and I wanted to be a rock star, let's go to California. So you got, okay, so you were going to college and then, you know, unfortunately your mom's passed. Life circumstances getting away. You're like, I'm not going back to school, I need a break, 
let me go with my friend to Formula One race car driver. And, and this is this is where this is where uh, uh, Young Waldrop decided he was going to be a rock star. But I came to California to be a yes. rock star. Yeah. And what, you're really, you're really, actually, the flow of this conversation is going very well because you're answering a lot of questions I had. Well, it's you know. You're young. Yeah, you're, I mean, I don't boundless you. ambition. Especially, um, you're about twenty twenty one at this point. Uh, yeah, exactly. So perfect time to turn it up. You, you, you know, get you, lit. You, you leave out, <laughs> leave leave the home front and and head out to, to California. And what the what? It, how much how much money did you have in your pocket, Walter? I had during that last six eight months of of living and working in Detroit because mm-hmm. everybody's. Father or neighbor was involved in the automobile industry. Yeah. Uh, when I got done with the spring semester at college from University of Michigan, I knew I wasn't going back. Yeah. And I went to work in in an automobile plant. Oh, that and was the good money. Ford back Motor then. Company was paying I don't know, it was twenty twenty five bucks an hour. I worked seven That's days good. a week, That's twelve good hours now. a day. <laughs> you get a lot of overtime. It was you know you're wow. bringing home seven eight hundred dollars a week. So you were doing you're doing okay. So I put money in the bank, bought myself a Chevy Vega. And uh, and that's the, the road, uh, you know, hit the road coming west with I don't know, a few thousand bucks in my pocket, and, and said I'm you know, Michigan's in my past, and uh, although I still have a lot of friends there and, mm-hmm. and connections to that neck of the woods and love Michigan a lot, it was California, and I've lived here ever since. No one leaves California. I came here for a girl, <laughs> like There's ten, good twelve years ago. That lasted about a year, year and a half, and yet here I am. Married to another girl, kid. And now a father. Congratulations. Father, yeah, father now. Working on, you know, my, you know, my bachelor's. I mean, I probably could have had a doctor's as much time as I spent fumbling around throughout school. That's okay. There's no hurry. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, professional student. If you you can, if you can continually educate yourself Mm -hmm. and support yourself and whatever family commitments you've got at the same time, what's better than that? You know, the, the, the... the quest to, to just make killer amounts of money mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily feed the soul in the same way as liking to get up every day yeah. and do what you do. So I understand yeah. there's financial realities. And it's, you know, it's easy for me to say I own a house on the west side and mm-hmm. I have a building full of studio equipment and so forth. But I can remember you know being a, a 20-something and experiencing that with other people. I mean, I had my uncle mm-hmm. introduce me to some people in Hollywood who had, you know, gave me a tour of uh, vid film and other places like that. And I go, wow, this is amazing. And you never think that those things in your life are going to add up to much, but you know, at they the do. end of fifty years now, it's actually worked out pretty well. I've had a great time and and see myself in a position of basically, you know, doing the things I like to do, audio wise and professionally, um, you know, until there isn't Mark Waldrop anymore. So how did you how did you transition? Because I mean, I really do in my head. I want to just jump to, you know, what got your start, this and that. But I still kind of want to know what. What happened? You go there with a formula racer friend. You're going to play guitar. How did that... Because I know that's a, a bit of a... Well, I'm sure that must have been an interesting time. It was. We came out... He, I was. I spent that winter, you know, uh, the winter of 73, 74, with my Vega and some other friends in, in Aspen, Colorado, skiing all winter. Okay. Ski bumming. So another trip. Yeah. Us. He came out... My, my friend Mike mm-hmm. um, came out and uh, went to Bill Russell in Willow Springs out in Rosemont, California, okay. Palmdale. And was racing cars. I caught up with him in the spring, and, mm-hmm. and then we lived in an apartment in Santa Monica for a while. Yeah. Uh, here, he got bored, and, yeah. and while he did ride, uh, do, did race Formula Fords and had a Lotus and so forth, he took off and went back to, to and Detroit. And you stayed, and I stayed. Um, and why'd you stay? Well, there wasn't anything to go back home for for me so back there. Well, that's not completely true. I was, you know, I, I had a girlfriend at the time who ended up. Being my, my first uh, marriage, my mm-hmm. first wife, yeah, and uh, and then she moved out here. Okay. So there was there were connections into California okay. at that point, but you know I played guitar. Uh, <laughs> what was met, this? Oh, sorry. Well, I met some people here who okay. also made music, and and they said okay. you should join this band. So we were the backup band for these three beautiful women. Okay, and they what was the know, name of the band. <laughs> it was it was the name of the women. Well, I, we were just the backup band. Okay. But the guy in Hollywood agreed to pay me to play in this band. Oh, so wow. I told my girlfriend, I'm not coming back to U of M in the fall. I'm staying here. And then the band fell apart. And, and Oh. Yeah, so you know, it was one of those. It didn't really work out too well. But I enjoyed playing music. And But I, at that point, realized what the difference was between, between being a very skilled, 
professional musician. Mm -hmm. And while I am a good musician, you're not. I'm not one of those. And I realized that even eight, ten hours a day of practicing wasn't getting me to the point where I was going to be Larry Carlton or Mitch Holder or yeah. Tommy Tedesco or one of these big guys that I wanted to be. And 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 so I, you know, I said. Music is a lot of fun, and I don't want to be away from music. Yeah. What can I do? And at the same time that I was out here pray, playing guitar. And, Santa Monica. Yeah, Santa Monica, and taking lessons down at the World of Strings in, in Long Beach with Ron Ashtay, who I ended up making a record with 40 years later. Mm -hmm. um, the engineering side, I was a, always kind of a tech head, had mm -hmm. tape machines. My dad was a ham radio operator, so we took oh. apart radios, and, and he gets and built my own guitar amp and, and oh, things wow. like that. So I had technical, you know, engineering know-how know -how on a practical level, mm -hmm. and and so when I see a, an ad in some magazine, mix magazine, or something like that, says Sherwood Oaks Experimental College, learn how to be an audio engineer. Really? So, Brian Inglesby, who since passed away, he and his wife had started this program, this school, ultimately it ended up to be called Soundmaster Recording School. At the Universal Hilton, they had classes. Oh. And much like the input position that I'm drawing, you know, on Tuesday nights around here for this program, it's the same stuff from 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Signal flow, right? And so, and I really grooved on that stuff a lot. I found it, myself really comfortable and able to understand and could see the marriage of art and music. Mm -hmm. uh, I stayed in school. I mean, I went through, through Santa Monica and then eventually went to Cal State Northridge. Mm -hmm. And studied music composition, so reading and writing notes, mm -hmm. musicianship, and so from architecture to yeah. composition, music and um, outside of, I guess, um, you know, the mainstream acad academia, you did the you did the engineering in that uh, with that, right. this, that couple that started that. So I really school. didn't do the, yeah, I did that uh, for a couple semesters, and then you know I was at Cal State Northridge, and, and a gentleman by the name of Dale Manquin, mm -hmm. who's a very big name in the world of, of audio engineering, and design, he was the first guy to put all the electronics in the base of a large multi-track uh, two, two inch tape machine, yeah. a 16 track, and just the meters up top. Mm -hmm. was the first, and he was a teacher at Cal State Northridge, taught an audio engineering class. Okay. So I took his class, um, did well, enjoyed the lectures, and at the very last day of class, this when 1977, 78, mm -hmm. he puts up on the board two job listings, one second engineer and the mm -hmm. other was sort of a technician job repair, you know, maintenance guy at a studio over in North Hollywood. And yeah. I whispered to the guy next to me, I said, those are our jobs. And sure enough, <laughs> both of us were hired at Mama Joe's um, <laughs> to record. I was a second engineer, and he became the, the staff maintenance technician. Okay. And I worked there for two years. So and that was your, so you're still going to school and training, but now you're getting the on-the-job right. actual experience with what you know, and plus your ability to learn you know, um, as far as engineering and the, you know, maybe breaking down those ham radios kind of helped with your Oh, dad. absolutely. I've, I've always been comfortable with the, the understanding of the guts and the operation of stuff, which I think has is, is contributed largely to, to how I'm portrayed in the audiophile world because mm -hmm. I produce and, and develop records, but I also understand how the equipment contributes to great sound. But, you know, I saw up close and personal through uh, Billy Taylor and... and and uh, Joe Bellamy, two engineers that were the staff guys over there, and mm -hmm. others yeah. that came in and did their projects. Some Ambrosia. I mean, there were big bands that were coming through there. Big bands. And I hung there. around for you know two years of that, uh, setting up microphones. I had access to the studio in off hours, so I spent mm -hmm. tons and tons of hours um, working through all of the stuff that was you know the raw material. Of what makes so, an audio engineer? So this is this is the part where you're taking what you learned in school, what you learned on the job, what you learned from your father, you know, at a young age, and also you're realizing the, the value of your technical knowledge. Because you saw that job, and you're like, those are our jobs. You immediately kind of identified that this is it. Just like you kind of were in the class, you said in that hotel, the Hyatt, whatever, yeah. when they did the, you were like, okay, this is, I can do this. Everything clicked for me. It was the left brain, right brain stuff, you know, in, in a... You can see really the art and balance. you can see the exactly. science, the math and the, you know, the beauty behind it. So I, you know, I kept going to school. Mm -hmm. I graduated from Cal State uh, Northridge in 1970, what, 78? Okay. Uh, again in 79 with a All master's right. degree, uh, 82 and 86. Oh boy, I'd have to look at my resume exactly. But I, 
I graduated four times from there because while I was doing that, I was also um, working as the staff repair technician, recording engineer the for the Department of Music. Music nice. Department. So you're there. You got a state gig. There's not a lot of you know activity going on during mm -hmm. the daytime. Sit in my office and making copies and basically studying for my PhD exams. Oh, wow. um, and you know uh, I, I started uh, going to uh, to UCLA in their PhD program in music in composition. Yeah. Music and composition. So you continued yeah. with the composition. Yeah. Well, that was what I was good at. I'm not a great player. I play piano mm -hmm. and guitar reasonably well, well enough anyway. But the, the assembling notes and, and, and that theory stuff was, was engaging to me. And mm -hmm. I then embraced the electronic music, the, the sort Synth. of synthesis and MIDI. And uh, in fact, when I went to, to Cal State uh, Northridge and then I went to UCLA, uh -huh. I spent two years at UCLA and said, this isn't for me because the faculty just weren't that inspiring to me. Yeah, They were yeah. kind of old school and I did get you know kind of turned off. And I had a friend uh, who was, had been a pro piano professor of mine. Mm -hmm. um, this is Brad. No, Gaylord Mowry was his name. Okay. And so I went, uh, he had started working at Santa Monica College and then he moved out to Cal Arts. Mm -hmm. I said, Cal Arts, I'll go check that out. Mm -hmm. That's the place. Cal to Arts. Be. Cal Arts out in Valencia, California. Yeah. They put on a music festival every year. Uh, Charles Dodge, Yusachevsky, Luslovsky, Steve Reich, John Adams, you name anybody who's who, 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 who's who of 21st, 20th century composition, they go to that festival or they teach and work there. I studied with Mort Zabotnik, I studied with Lucky Moscow, I studied with Earl Brown, I studied with uh, Mort, or uh, with, uh, um, gosh, I've just lost him. Uh, Mel Powell. So you got a degree for, in composition from so Cal Arts? I, so I went out to Cal Arts and got a Master's of Fine Arts degree working with Buchla synthesizers and, and running the labs with my friend Peter who I now you know, deal with out of San Diego. Okay. Um, and then I went back I said, well you got to finish UCLA. So mm -hmm. I went back to UCLA and Alden Ashforth became my mentor. He kind mm -hmm. of was the electronic music guy uh, in there. Mm -hmm. And I went into his class and he I remember this very distinctly. There were, I don't know, half a dozen of us, something like that, in the class. Yeah. And he hands us a cassette. And okay. on that cassette is the sound of, you know, clomping boots on cobblestones and a seal bark and a fog horn, just like a collection uh, of music ADR concrete. Well, this is ADR. just a raw material. And he says, oh, here material. you go, turn this into something. <laughs> so he, I had access to the uh, CSUN, you know, lot. Like yeah. I, I was teaching it at that time. And so I went in there with these tapes, transfer stuff, added reverb, played it backwards, edited all the stuff in, and I played this two-minute music concrete piece yeah. for Alvin Ashford. And he didn't say anything. I mean, he was just, wow. Because the other guys played the dog bark backwards, and you, you know, it was kind of, the, the regular. kind of obvious. <laughs> but I had been teaching this stuff, so I had, I had facility in that regard. Mm -hmm. And that night, you know, I get a phone call, and it's kind of a, an inebriated Alvin Ashford. Who, uh, in, to 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 make a long story short, he just picked up my career and said, "I'll get you through this program." He had never heard anything that 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 had that much sophistication out of such mm -hmm. raw material. So he became my mentor and my hero. Somebody I hadn't run into when I was at UCLA the first time. I was mm -hmm. Henry Lazaroff and the traditional, you know, sort of write the notes down and score and so forth, which wasn't mm -hmm. my thing. I, yeah. I, I did pretty well. I wrote a couple of symphonies and string quartets and stuff. But it was electronic music. It was mm -hmm. that fusion of tape technique and synthesis and computers and MIDI. All that stuff was the perfect amalgamation of stuff that I was good at, comfortable with, and was able to turn into you know both my academic as well as my professional pursuits. Okay. So this is the part definitely, um, because like you said, he became your... Alden, Ash Alden Ashforth Forth. was one of the faculty members at at, uh, at UCLA Composition okay. Department who who carried the ball for me all the way through to my PhD. Okay, and I did the first electronic music composition doctorate at, at UCLA. So that that's another question I had. Uh, notable technolog technological innovations did you pioneer? Kind of <laughs> a little well, bit. Well, look, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's an ego trip in a way, but yeah, there's some some red letter uh, uh, components to my career. The, that was a first one. I mean, I took a 
a binaural recording head. Yeah. I have my stereo Nagra that, that I had bought in, in the mid-1980s because I was doing production film sound, yeah. which is a portable device. Mm -hmm. And I took it up in a hot air balloon with this binaural head, and I went up to a cave in Northern California and basically collected, again, a whole bunch of raw material raw in 3D audio because everything's being recorded through the binaural head's ears. So when you put headphones on, which my committee of doctoral you know, uh, mentors all sat there with my Nagra playing and they all had a set of headphones on and they're listening to this 3D composition running around in space. So they were all thrilled. That was a first. But okay. I, you know, yes. well, I, I, I later, you know, I'm always looking out for interesting and new technology. Okay. So when, uh, in the uh, late 90s, um, I did CD-ROM programs. You told, you did mention my, that. My master's degree in computer science was about using CD-ROMs under the control of a, a, a Mac computer to do language training. Okay. Um, so that was, that was a red letter day. In 1997, okay. uh, you may or may not remember, on, in March of 1997. This is the one, this is like the before. This was the, the DVD video. The DVD, okay. I think you I made the first DVDs that That's were released right. in the United made States. made the first DVDs that were released. made four converted laser disc with a partner up in Colorado uh -huh. and bought the hardware. I mean, this was a partnership between me and a replication facility and spent a half a million dollars and trained up a bunch of people to, to do Dolby digital encoding and MPEG-2 encoding and turned mm -hmm. the raw material of a laser disc into a DVD video disc. Okay. And we got them on the market, you know, in, in March, March 19th of 1997. Um, when nobody knew what a DVD was. Nobody okay. cared what a DVD was. So let's go, let's go back again. So you, you're doing big things. You've got, you know, these kind of bullet points of achievement and kind of being ahead of the curve technologically. And you yeah, know, when there's no money around for them. When there's, well, I mean, there, what, because that also leads to the question I'm asking, what, what were some of the, um, what were some of the, I guess, the, the ways you, you figured out how to hustle your technical knowledge of stuff to earn supplemental income? Because... What I'm going to ask after that is how students, like people new into audio engineering and stuff, like students like myself sure. and people in the class, how can they do that today? Because we're living in a, I mean, it's not so different in some ways. It's not so different in some ways. In but, fact, in some ways it's easier. True. Because it's less expensive. We had big studios that you had to fund and be in. So how did you fund well, your, your stuff? You know, I've always there? had sort of a little entrepreneurial flame burning. Okay. And was selling ashtrays made out of pottery in the basement when I was in kindergarten. Kind <laughs> okay, of thing, you so know? it started there. There was a little bit of, of lemonade stand kind of mentality. Yeah, so it wasn't completely, you know, outside of my, my realm. But in, uh, at Cal State Northridge again, mm -hmm. I taught the electronic music studio classes. Okay. The, the faculty member there, Aurelio De La Vega, who's still alive. I saw him not too long ago. He was he's 85 or something like oh, that wow. now. Did a bunch of things with him, including studios in Venezuela and but, okay. but I ran the facility, and turns out the electronic music facility was in the ice, the uh, sound booths up above the recital hall at Cal State Northridge. And all the, student, all the music students, singers, players, they had to put on a senior recital, okay. master students as well. And part of the requirement was that it was recorded and then put along with your dissertation or your thesis or whatever, you know, or you wanted it for mom and dad. So um, that was an opportunity. So for you I've to, got the equipment sitting right there in the room. Like, hey. And I started C Sound, you know, the C S U N with an O and a D in there, made flyers and, and so every weekend, Saturday for three, you know, recitals and Sunday for three recitals, especially at the end of the semester, mm -hmm. I would record these these recitals for so these folks. X amount of dollars and it, a pop. Yeah, was I'll you made hundred dollars in a day, you know, okay. sitting there upstairs just hitting the button. So what's a what's another one that you did? Because I'm because the reason I ask is because me I have to I mean I have to kind of know how things work. Some of the stuff you do, I'm like that's that it's like how did you do it? But also like you know uh, you know expensive software hardware you don't well, you, buy that with lemonade. No, you don't. <laughs> but, but, you know? I mean, look, part of that is a is a do you use somebody else's money? Do you use your own money? Mm -hmm. Do you convince somebody that you have a compelling idea? Yeah. Look, and, and I would be you know uh, a big shot you know Silicon Valley guy if I was smart. Mm -hmm. I just I said at the time um, this again I mentioned Peter, my San Diego friend, because mm -hmm. we're involved in the speaker project now through Indiegogo, which is yeah. actually happening right now. Um, but he and I were CalArt students. Okay. We get we're called or hired. 
to, to record a, an album for okay. New Albion Records. Um, we have the, the ensemble is there, the California Union. Oh, because the art student. The, yeah, this ensemble, there. who was kind of the resident new music group okay. there, says, we want to do this piece called uh, uh, Hocatus by Luis Andresen. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, let's do that. Mark, you've got your 16-track studio recorder. We'll put it on a truck. We'll take it out to CalArts. We'll record eight tracks of of the band playing the first part of the Hocatus part, and then we'll go back and overdub the second part, because it's Hocatus is a Hocatus, ba da ba da ba da ba da so it's like an echo. Okay. So I said, okay, that sounds like a, an interesting weekend. We'll get a couple hundred bucks, whatever, we'll have a great time. And it turned into a nightmare, because the piece is just full of lots and lots of repeats, and a, a hocket in straight eighth notes has got to be da 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 It can't be da 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 like a galloping mm -hmm. horse or something. And we couldn't get it. So that it sounded like two ensembles playing simultaneously because we were doing everything overdub. Yeah, became a complete nightmare. Yeah. Well, we finally made it through that process after saying, "Okay, we're going to scrap everything we've done. Mm -hmm. We're going to have them play it," and and so we finally got it done. But the tra that was an analog mix. Yes. Mixed down into a two-track master was going to find its way onto a CD. Mm -hmm. How do you make a CD? Well, this was you know early '80s. CDs only came around at '82. Mm -hmm. So. Well, you could go out to, you know, uh, there was a place in Pasadena, a mastering place that, that I had used once that used VHS tapes that had a, a JVC 900 editor on it. You paid them 50 bucks an hour, and, and, and they're doing nonlinear editing. That was a little iffy. Um, but somebody mentions the Digital Brothers down in Newport Beach. Digital Brothers, and you go into their parents' house, you walk <laughs> through the living room where the one brother is, is you know, hawking uh, Tibetan artifacts and chant type <laughs> stuff, and the other brother is down in his bedroom in the back, he's got a Mac 2 computer with the, t the top torn open, he's got a rack of gear in, in the bathroom, two big B&W speakers, a little 15-inch color monitor, and he's able to actually load up a digital DAT tape, is what we had at the time, and edit it on the screen of a computer. Oh, wow. How cool is that? This is in the late 80s? This was, yeah, in the late 80s. Oh, my God. That's super kind The first of time I had seen it, well, we had Sound Tools, which was mm -hmm. the, the Pro, uh, Pro Tools Forerunner. Yeah. Um, that was, you know, 2100 bucks, and that was a toy. You couldn't do anything with it. Yeah. This tool that Sonic Solutions made, mm -hmm. a company up in the Bay Area, that was in this wire-wrapped board that he had a custom version of, mm -hmm. allowed us to do edits that were just impossible in any other way. Uh, and I was a good razor blade editor in the analog uh, mm -hmm. world before, still know how to do that pretty well. But I said, the light went off. So I said, I gotta have that. So you had to, you're, you're gonna have to negotiate something with these guys to get well, access I, to Well, I wanna talk to the, the people up in San Francisco, Andy Moore and Bob Doris and Mary Sauer, the people that started Sonic Solutions. Mm -hmm. They started their company based on the fact that the CDs were coming around. All these old recordings that were full of hiss and crackle and pop and distortions, yeah. their tools could solve all that. So I had to have their tools. Well, the cost of their tools, outside of getting an expensive computer and four megs of RAM, which was $1,800 at the time, and speakers and DAP machines and DACs and all this other stuff, it was probably you know a few thousand, maybe six, seven thousand dollars at that point. I owned a house um, out in uh, in Chatsworth at the time, and you know the home equity line looked real attractive. So, so you, you convince your spouse to say, you know, <laughs> I need to take some money and I'm going to get a FedEx box for forty four point one thousand dollars. It's forty four point one thousand. Oh, okay. Just coincidentally, the sample rate so, in dollars. Gave oh, it was the same as. <laughs> It was $44,000 for this, this software, which came on floppy disks and a couple of cards that you put in your computer, and boom, I was off and running. Was that your first, because that's what I was, I was curious about, so you took a gamble. I took a you, big gamble. You took, that's a huge gamble, so you you borrowed against your house to buy this digital software editing. Spent about 50 grand, yeah. 50 grand borrowing against your house, so that's, hey... Hey, if you go big or go home. But you, look, <laughs> you realize at that point I had been doing recordings. You knew what you were doing. I had my Nagra. I was making classical music recordings all the mm -hmm. time. I was editing stuff for, for a lot of companies, New Albion included and others, uh, Cambria Records and others. I was known as a classical engineer that could record and edit and slice with a razor blade. If I could move that up to, I can pre-master your CD, do all these edits in classical music because I can read a score... Mm -hmm. Then I, I was busy all the time. And at that point, 
mastering a CD and doing all these edits, and I did add a sixty thousand dollar no noise option onto mm -hmm. this that allowed you to charge upwards of three hundred dollars a minute for processed audio. Oh my god! So you're making enough you money. Killing it. I tell people now, and, and anybody that's in business, it's a it's a basic premise. You just got to bring in more money every month than you're pushing out. Mm -hmm. So if you're bringing in a million dollars a month and and you know and you're spending a million too, you're, you've got an upside down business. If you're bringing a million dollars a month but you have to spend eight hundred thousand, you're still coming out ahead. Mm -hmm. it, and the numbers make you numb because man, that's a lot of money that you're spending every month. But look, I get to hang on to two hundred grand a month or whatever the number was when I had fifty yeah. employees in my company. It was that kind of number. So, but, you know, so you make those calculated risks. I never did yeah. business plans. I just said, you know, I need this tool. You did it. You just, and, and, yeah. and I did it. And, and it worked out. All right. Thankfully, knock on something, it worked out pretty well. So what would you, so that's what you did. That, so that gives me a kind of a clear, clear picture of what you were doing and how you kind of hit the, the ground running. I mean, obviously there were other little entrepreneurs like in Newport doing their thing, yep. you know what I mean, and providing services. You had the know-how, so you kind of probably saw it in your head, like, I can I can do this if I can get my hands on it, but I need a lot of money. Borrow against the house. Hey, wife, thanks. Okay, we're going to do this. I'm sure that wasn't a, a conversation no, you were excited to have. It still isn't easy. It, oh, <laughs> when you're still trying to make investments. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you contemplate this, this sound bar thing. We want to take the sound bar and, mm -hmm. and you know, make that commercially available because it's a very cool technology. It does something that nothing else does. But, you know, do you build a business plan around and try and engage people? Well, who knows? You know, they've already raised money and okay. loaned through a bunch of money. But it is a balancing act, and I have been fortunate that more times than not, um, it has worked out. You've come out on, on the, the positive, plus side. the plus side. So what are some um, suggestions you'd have today or you think for audio engineers in this time and age that they could probably, you know, earn some supplemental income, you know, trying to, you know, use their technological know-how? You know. Well, people in our in our audio production class, okay, and you're all writing a proposal. I want you to start thinking about things that you might like to do and that you could turn into a into a revenue stream. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, Trevin and, and others are talking about well, being mastering engineers. How do you get started being a mastering engineer? I did mm -hmm. it for 13 years. Did hundreds of albums that way. How do you do it? You just start doing it. You just start doing it. You do it for free. You got a record you need mastered. Let me master it and see if you like what I do. Yeah. Once you've done five, ten, twenty of those things, and people go, man, this guy's got it okay. He's uh -huh. got the gear. He's got a nice sounding room. Uh, what it goes off to the plan and comes back sounds great. Uh -huh. Then you start charging a hundred bucks for each one. And yeah. The next one is hundred bucks an hour kind of thing. Yeah, you start doing it for free so to get some people, get some references, you will, plus and it then start charging them. Set. Yeah. This, the same thing is true for, as I've been mentioning even in, in class this morning, on restoration. Yes. You know, I sprung for the $60,000 no-noise, de-crackle, de-click, yeah. because I knew there was a market for it at the time. Now, those very same tools, while it seems like a big expenditure, uh -huh. it's $700. Yeah. So spend the $700, put it on your laptop, and practice. Get really uh -huh. good at doing, you know, cough removal and scratch distortion removal, mm -hmm. and then build a website and say, I'll do this for your project for free. Mm -hmm. And then some symphony, maybe it's the Pasadena Symphony, or maybe it's the Palisade Symphony, or whoever will come along and say, you know, there's a guy I know that can, can get rid of those, those uh, so maybe, birds chirping in the middle of our symphonic performance, and yeah. boom, it starts to make sense. You have ah. to develop something you like doing that you get good at, that you can understand the software and, yes. and be ahead of the, the game with others, whether yeah. it's forensics or restoration or mixing or mastering, street corner you know, productions, yeah. uh, doing live sound reinforcement, theatrical sound design for you know, little uh, community theaters. All these things are opportunities that, that, that need the kind of expertise that students in our program have. Yeah, because I think a lot of students, they... Uh you know, they're, they're, we're getting down to, we're like more than halfway through this semester, next semester is the last one, and I know, I know, you know, at this age you need to start thinking a little ahead, you know, so you have that next jump, the next Absolutely. stone to step on, so I, I think that's a question a lot of uh, students would have had, so definitely, um, because I personally, I'm in, and I kind of want to ask your opinion on this, but like, it, like, you're saying potentially, you know, do something for free for a short period of time so you build up, you know, you're getting enough of an influx of people building up 
a, a reputation, then start charging incrementally. And you should have, you know, if you're doing it right and they come back. There's a real uh, strong possibility that built upon the expertise that you've got, mm -hmm. that there will some, come some opportunity. Look, I'm, I'm learning how to fly gliders right now. Mm -hmm. So what I go to the gliders website, mm -hmm. and it's terrible. <laughs> you see a business opportunity and right I now? Say, and I say to the lady out there, the wife of the man, who, uh, their partners in their venture of, of this soaring academy, I said, you know, Julie, this is, this is something I have expertise. She said, well, you know, the guy that's been doing this for us is an old guy, doesn't want to do it anymore. This is perfect timing. Great. It's your project. So I programmed their website. I put a little pro. I did the first one for free. I bought a theme, you mm -hmm. know, a WordPress theme that mm -hmm. looked somewhat like it'll work. I've got a bunch of those already that I've done other websites mm -hmm. for. And so, you know, having learned how, because I don't want to pay somebody to do a website yeah. when I can learn how to do that myself. And I you do, do it a, yourself. I have a degree in computer science. I understand enough how they work, and they make it, you know, reasonably easy. Uh, in terms of the tool set provided, you've got the patience to say, okay, I'm going to go through the tutorial and I'm going to learn how to make that master slider work. And I'm going to, and at the end of a month, a week, mm -hmm. a long weekend, whatever it takes, you've got a website that actually looks cool. For the book that I wrote, I built the websites. And so mm -hmm. when I open up the door at this Soaring Academy, yeah. I'm looking at an opportunity that could defray some of the cost by trading out my expertise against what they're offering at their you know, glider port. Yeah. So students can do the very same thing. You may not have the confidence yet because you haven't done it enough. Yeah. Build the confidence by doing it. Do it for yourself, then do it for your <laughs> friends, do it for... And somebody's going to say, Aaron, he's a guy that I know that can, <laughs> can do this for you. And you're going to say, you know, so how much money is in your budget? Yeah. And they'll say, I got 200 bucks. It's done. You got it. Yeah. 200 bucks. The next one's $500. The next one's whatever. Yeah. That stuff works, but look, my mantra, and, I, and it becomes a, a little tiresome, mm -hmm. don't do just enough, mm -hmm. do your very best. Don't if your do best the minimum. Measure, yeah, yeah. The mission, minimum in class or in professional life is only going to get you the modicum of success along the way. Yeah. Do the very best you can, right? If you've got talent and if you've got some ability um, and, and know the software and keep up with the, the, the deal, things are going to add up. Yes. My prime example of that in two, in, uh, two years ago, when yes. the class was over in the other, 452, I had gone to the AES convention that weekend, and my friend from CalArts... What's AES? Audio Engineering Society convention. Oh. It was in Los Angeles that Okay. Fall. So October, of course I'm going to go down there, not so much to see all the gadgets and pick up brochures, but to, to see people that I only see... When, when the AES comes. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, Alan Parsons is a friend. I see him when I'm there and a bunch of other people. I ran into my friend Peter, who I've known for 35 years at CalArts, mm -hmm. the same guy that did that audio recording that weekend with the California Air Unit. Yeah. Yep. And he says, he pulls out this, out of his backpack, he pulls out this little speaker array and says, check this out. So I put it up in front of me, and hits go, and boom, I got sound in three dimensions coming all around okay. my head. I said, That's cool. What have you been up to? Well, he and I have been in touch, but, but not, you know, visiting all the time. He's down in San Diego. I've been 25 years running the music technology program at UCSD, running graduate students through beamforming, wave field synthesis, you know, hmm. localization, directional audio, all these sort of cutting-edge things. And he says, you know, if you've got a little extra time, and I didn't, but I did. Okay. I said, sure, that sounds like fun. Sat with him and his CEO. They had raised some money. And I said, you know, what we ought to do is, is run a Kickstarter campaign to raise money to include your technology, this patented technology that they had in this company he was working with, mm -hmm. and make that available to customers. So you're definitely the type of individual, like, you're, you're skilled, obviously, you know, in composition, but also in some technological, you know, engineering, but definitely in kind of a, a bit of a, a kind of entrepreneurial savviness where you, like, know, like, Oh, this is a great idea, but you know what you should do if you want to make a little more money or make some money or well, market they're, this they're, That company in particular, <laughs> it, and it's, it's very timely right now because things are kind of crashing and burning, um, the former CEO was booted out because somebody came in with new money, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we did. I spent better part of eight months building their website, designing a product, naming it, building the logo, all the stuff they, they specified and built the, the demo units and so forth, the prototype units, and then contacted the Kickstarter people and got in touch with the right people. Had they helped promote? We raised $1.1 million on a Kickstarter campaign, the biggest Kickstarter campaign 
uh, for a sound product that, that had ever been, other than Pono, that was a player, uh -huh. Neil Young. So, great, that's a home run. That I had done my run. book before that, where I, you know, I raised a bunch of money uh, having promised to write a book. I got copies back there in the corner, and, <laughs> and I read it, wrote a 900-page book over the course of a couple of years. So there's, you can do it. Yeah, You okay. can learn how to lay out a book, and this sound bar was the same thing. So what, you, what you're always looking for is, is that a cool idea? Mm -hmm. Are other people doing the same idea at the same time? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, have I got an edge yes. because of my technical savvy or my business savvy yeah. or, or the opportunity is early enough in the business? You know, it's like being in the dope business with this, you know, cannabis stuff now. Yeah. There are people making boatloads of money because they know that world. I don't know that world. Yeah. But if you invest in the right way or you're attached to the right people, you know, you can, you can get ahead. Audio and sort of cutting edge directional 3D audio, mm -hmm. even where my record label has been and, and the studio that I put together and so forth, that's worked out really well. By just the essence there is to, to be ahead of the game, uh -huh. to be to keep your fingers in, in what's sort of the current state of the mm -hmm. art, to build a network of people that know who you are and what yes. you're doing. I found that writing a blog every day mm -hmm. for three or four years was a great thing to elevate my stature in the business. And, and make the book sale a success, and, mm -hmm. and it translated also into the soundbar stuff. So, uh, it's all possible. Yes. But it's not going to happen for the person who doesn't turn in their homework, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't care, you know, really. Yeah, no, because that's if the same person. If this is what you're studying and wanting a career, why yeah. am I going to give it a hoot if, if you don't care? Okay. Um, so, obviously, you know, you got to work hard, you need to, you know, you got to show up. You got to do all the basics. The, you got all the basics, essentially. <laughs> but what, for some for some people, you know, things are not, you know, <laughs> so yeah, look, they're the not people, willing to put an effort. Well, the people that come through our program, and, and you know, I'm not ashamed to say it. There yeah. are, I know, and I've been doing this for over 20, 25 years now, that there are, there are a handful of students. Thankfully, there have been more lately. Mm -hmm. I think the digital. You know, social network stuff has helped a lot. Yeah. There's always going to be if 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 it's 25 students, five of them have really got the heads on. Bright lights, yeah. smart. I could probably work. pick pick the five right now. Exactly. And you better believe I I already <laughs> because I know like you know obviously my thing more is talking, but I do have technological know how. Not so much. I'm not a master audio engineer, but I do know how to you know get around the internet and computers and. If you need me to do something, you know, I could probably invest the time and hours to figure out how it's done. But what I really like about the program is I see the people that are immediately shining bright in certain areas, like Jose Melendez with Adobe After Effects and yep. the animation. I had him do my logo, movement of it. I had uh, uh, Michael Barakat, I had because mm -hmm. he's designed logos and illustrator vectors. I had him design the actual logo. Jose did animation, and then. Writing, um, I'd say Alex and also, um, what's his name, uh, Stephen Adams. Oh. Yeah, but then I had Alex, he wrote he wrote my longer theme song, and he wrote my like 15 second one that I have that goes along with the logo. So you're a producer in this instance. You recognize, <laughs> I'm a producer. So you, act, you, you, you access the talents of the people that you recognize around yeah. you and will be able to contribute. Because to I, I know who... That's a talent too. I know who's competent. Like, I know immediately who's confident even like barry he like uh barry sutton in our program he's i can't i i, I don't want to say i know what his talent is but i know he's extremely talented he's uh, maybe it's more his am, am, ambition and learning and curiosity because i'll see him sit down there with them synthesizers and just go and just mm -hmm. signal flow it he's doing it he's like he would be on top of subjects before we would be learning in class like just teaching himself and people have actually already been coming up to him he doesn't want me to share it so much but people have already been approaching him about like oh how much do you charge for this or whatever and then he's not marketing himself it's just becoming known that he can do have certain talents and people are approaching him sure. you know um for that stuff so you i'm a music i'm a producer you find out where you're comfortable look at uh, jackie <laughs> who was a part of this program a couple of years ago not, um you know not a not a rocket okay. scientist in terms of the engineering prowess but i see she's a facebook friend she's out there handling logistics for large concerts and mm -hmm. wanting people to come in and be you know handle this responsibility and that responsibility that ability to manage a project mm -hmm. and coordinate while understanding the technical needs of what needs to happen 
That's as yeah. valuable a skill as the person pushing the faders up and down. I think that's kind of where I want to get more proficient is my my technical knowledge of, you know, some of the audio and the visual, the video stuff, you know, some of that because, like, I, I can look at the hardware, I can look at the software, I can touch it and move it around, but some of the inner workings, you know, some of the expertise you, you know, or I guess what you got, not only just from picking apart the ham radios with your dad, but also... Um, working in that you know uh, that music department or whatever and having yeah. access to those tools and using those tools I do want um, I want more of that so I can communicate with the people and at least know what's what it's going to take so I can pick the people be like okay I know That's they have nice. that skill set bring them in I know they have that skill set sure bring them in because I'm kind of I'm kind of already doing that with some of my things you know what I mean with some of my projects I'm working on like the podcast and stuff I'll I'll get people involved, like, hey, can you do this? Can you do that? And when else are we going to get access to this many talented individuals in well, one space? And you my know, point of talking about time. Peter is, after 35 years of having been in, in class and studied in the same institution, yeah, that he opens up the door for me to involve myself with something that's, you know, a major business enterprise. Yeah, that's huge. The, the same thing is a network of people within the cohort of students in our class to recognize those that are got their headlights up bright and yeah. say I need to be friends with and want to remain in contact and connection because I may have something that needs their talents <clears throat> and they may along the way also be looking back and say you know Aaron would he'd be perfect for this look it took 35 years yeah <clears throat> but I told my class when I walked in after that weekend of seeing Peter at the AES I said I've just hooked into an opportunity and I will Dimes to donuts, mm -hmm. I will be working for these people, with these people. And I've spent a year and a half as a consultant with them, yeah. you know, on a monthly retainer and a percentage of their Kickstarter raise. Absolutely. That's what I'm talking about. I want that, I want that repeat, that perpetual, that uh, residual monthly income. I'm Selling gonna... a book every day is a pretty good feeling. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if my <clears throat> brother Kelly and I are headed down with a... You know, a grocery bag full of books to the post office. Mm -hmm. It's been a good day. You're trying to be that J. You're trying to get on that J.K. Rowling. Oh man, that's, like, a, that's a whole. Uh, that's a whole. There's always going to be some She's big the best, uh, best selling author in the history of the written language. Yeah, I'm listening to an audio book, and they mentioned her, and they mentioned like you know people that are kind of at the top of the fields and certain things, and that kind of delineate from you know what the norm is, the kind of extremes. Um, Look, that's the Michael Jordan kind of success. It's, it's yeah. the threading the needle, it's one in a million. If you can have success at a moderate level, mm -hmm. it feels the same. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't got you know a, a, a Gulfstream 6 jet, mm -hmm. but, you, you, you know... <laughs> you take you borrow against the home again, maybe you will. <laughs> yeah, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> uh, I do want to get some more. How much? Uh, how much time do you have? Do you have like another half I have, an hour? I have, yeah, probably just about that because I have a phone call with Peter okay. at uh, at two o'clock. Okay, so um, I do want to hit uh, a few more questions. Did you? Was there? Because um, I didn't. I know your dad did the pilot. Did your mom play instruments, or did she do anything like that? Uh, mom was pretty much the the prototypical homemaker. Stay at home, take care of the kids. Give you a little self confidence, maybe. Except, yeah, she did. And and what was most impressive, I guess, about my mom is that when she lost her husband, mm -hmm. what do you do? You, you go get a job. Mm -hmm. you, you you sustain your family. You you know she did all of those things that were completely new to her. So yeah, my aunt was. That might better. have been where you learned how to do things that are completely new to you and kind of you take charge when things. Very are. impressive because mm -hmm. coming from a homemaker and then all of a sudden you're. Your life support, your emotional support, your you know you, you go through this small this long decline of seeing seeing somebody that you know is a six foot two you know standing down and turn into a ninety pound you know about to erase life. That's a tough thing to see. It's tough for kids, and I remember it, but it's much tougher when that's your partner. That's crazy. You say, yeah. okay, great. I'm going to go sell clothes at the local department store, and so uh, we managed, and then she got sick. You know, that's yeah. that's. The sad part of that is then the kids, including me primarily, mm -hmm. pick up where the spouse would be and mm -hmm. take care of that person until their time is, is up. So how how did, because, um, and the only reason I know of this is because I've, because I've been out in, you know, I guess doing my audio engineering, trying to get experience and interning, um, like at Studio 770, mm -hmm. and I've come across quite a few of your <clears throat> previous students, uh, Troy, uh, Ambroff, uh, <clears throat> Jennifer Troy? Ortiz, I think, and uh, there's an Asian guy that works, he does audio and video at a hotel somewhere. Um, <clears throat> well, there's a guy at USC, uh, gosh, 
he was an Asian guy, but I, I no, look, I, I hear from a lot of people. Yeah, and they, they, the, what I'm saying is they'd mentioned that um, at some point, I guess, during the semester, you'd gotten sick um, with a cancer, yeah. was it? And when I told him, I was like, yeah, uh, doctor, you know, my teacher's Dr. Waldrip, and, you know, he's teaching us all this stuff. And like, everyone's always like, oh, I remember Waldrip. And, but anytime anybody tries to, you know, complain, like, or I say, like, man, he's working us, or this or that, they're always like, yeah, he's really hard, but, like, the stuff, he's right about the signal flow. Everybody remembers the signal flow. <laughs> but they were like, yeah, he was really, at that time, he, he seemed like he was really sick, and they're like, wow, he's still teaching. And I was just like, yeah, he's still He's still doing it. You're, I mean, you're flying the gliders. You're doing, you know, I mean, you're doing a lot. You said you were running marathons for a while. Like, I ran the marathon seven times. How, how did you beat cancer? Well, you know what I mean. Look, the, how did you the, do it? The, the cancers, it's now plural. Yeah. That that I've had. Okay. Um, one is thyroid. That okay. Was the first one, my son, who was 29 at the time, also had thyroid cancer. Wow. Big time. My brother's had thyroid cancer and had surgery. That's a five. serious one because that's the glands. No, that's that's one that's actually if you gotta if you gotta enter the cancer realm, that's one. If it's identified and dealt with early, I take a couple of pills to take care of the mm -hmm. the thyroid that I don't have anymore. I have a little slit on my neck. Mm -hmm. That's a, you know. Uh, it was a surprise. They went in for some other reason to that area to look at a parathyroid gland. And mm -hmm. While it was on the table, they, they, you know, the doctor, well, this doesn't look right. They had the pathologist check it, and mm -hmm. so I had uh, my thyroid removed okay. uh, because it was cancer. Then you, you follow up with taking a radioactive pill and, and iodine and the rest of it, and that mm -hmm. takes care of things on that side. So, you know, when you, when you get, I'm 65, yeah. when you get to be a senior citizen, stuff yeah. starts breaking, and all that stuff that you've done, whether it's smoking, I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but other things in lifestyle, mm -hmm. and maybe it's some genetics as well, since there's so much of it in my family. Yeah, um, those things start to affect you. So you, you know, that was that was June of 2015, and mm -hmm. and, uh, and you come out of that saying, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to do better. I, the yeah. whole marathon thing. I had my good friend Mike Denicky who invented the time code slate. Was a major audio guy. Father time. He invented the time code slate. The time code slate is his invention. Yeah. So, and I worked with him doing production sound for yeah. years. He's a really smart guy, he knew electronics and sound, and, and I bought my studio gear from him. You know, he's hiking in the mountains with his, his new wife, he's 57, keels over from a heart attack. Wow. And, and you go, oh my God, and you know, it's one day here and, and gone the next. Yeah. What would you do? And so I started running. And, and mm -hmm. just, I'm not a great runner, but, but I enjoyed the social thing. I got down on the beach on Saturday mornings with my friends, and. And, uh, and, you know, almost eclipsed five-hour marathons. You're crazy. You're crazy. <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was a thing that I enjoyed doing. I, I did the last one the other day, or what, just a couple of years ago, actually. And, uh, and I slammed that medal down after that weekend down on the table. I said to my class, I said, I did it. I crossed the line. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm done. You're done. I'm done because you know, in the middle of that race, I was almost done. Done. I sat down on the, on the bench in Beverly Hills. And I said, "I'm done." I said, "You know, but I can't go into class tomorrow and say I gave up halfway." You couldn't. You couldn't <laughs> live with yourself if you said I, that. So look, I walked a lot, but I got across the finish line, and, and uh, nothing to brag about. But it's something you to put your mind to something, to brag, and you can you can yeah. get there. You, that's amazing. I mean, that's that's crazy. I mean. I think even, <clears throat> I think it's even more, like, admirable because, I mean, obviously you'd already dealt with the history of running into, you know, yeah, cancer. Right. So for you, <clears throat> you know, as far as we come in life, for you to have to experience that yourself and then, I'm sure, potentially reflect, like, uh, now me? Like, are you kidding me? And then your yeah. son, like, that, the mental fortitude to be able to deal with that and kind of move forward... That's great. I mean, that's well, look. That's the only, a lot. The only, look, I'm using gliders as the alternative, or the, <laughs> the real life model here. But yeah. you know, the instructors that I've got out there saying, and I think what they, what they stress is, you know, you're you're on a glider. You don't have an engine. Yeah. So when you're coming into land, you're coming into land. You're not. Whether you want you're to not going around, which is what you can do with a plane. <laughs> no short turn on the <laughs> turn on the power, and oh, that didn't work out so well. Let's just go yeah. around again. You know, gliders, you can't do that. So the, 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 the line that I've gotten from, from Frank, my instructor, uh, any number of times, is because I am soloing the plane now, is don't give up. Yeah. 
no matter what circumstance you're in, yeah, you can't give up. Yeah, because if you do, you're going to hit the ground hard. And in gliders, that's not a tragedy. But you know, you can mess things up, and then people get hurt, and planes get damaged, and nobody's happy. So you just don't give up. Mm -hmm. and, and look, you're coming in, you know, too steep. You're coming in at the end and kind of porpoising, whatever. You're doing all this stuff. That's you got to get that plane on the ground. Yeah. So the, the same, you know, it sounds kind of philosophical and maybe Cornwall, but the, the fact is life is like that too. Yeah. You can't give up. I, I, I firmly believe that, like, uh, that <clears throat> you just kind of got to keep moving forward no matter what because, like, you know, I, I'm sure we, I know personally I've been in dark places, you know, as far as, like, depression or this or that or just some life event, you know sure. what I mean? And you're just like, I know what it's like to remain stagnant and just feel bad about yourself. It's like... You're better off just moving forward, and Get a just. Going. <laughs> I got a dog. It, it works for me. I got a dog, and I can tell you sometimes I have a rough day. I just hug my dog. I'm like, they're like little love eaters. Dog's just... a great thing. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes my day on, just, on a lot of days. Yeah. So yeah, no, I mean that's that's the sensibility, and, and all of us go through that stuff, and I've had my share for sure. Yeah. And, and I haven't beaten all of them yet, but the the reality is, you get up one day at a time, and you figure out what am I going to do to. to you know, to make it through this day, to succeed, to, to enjoy the, uh, the the things that life authored, authors. Yes. And, and music has been one of those. I've, I've, I've got a catalog of recordings that I'm very, very proud of. And, yeah. and so, you know, at the end of the day, what you're going to be hoping is that by the time you get to the end of your life, however that span is, that you've, yeah. you've lived it with some measure of, of pride and quality and, 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 you know, the people around you have, have come to appreciate that and you've appreciated them. I mean, that's... That, like I found, it's not that far a leap to be your age or the kid's age in mm -hmm. these in these classes, and blink and be a sixty-year-old. Yeah, it goes by. I believe you that fast, and so especially as a new dad. Yeah, every day. Yeah, every single day. Yeah, he's already <laughs> growing pretty quick. He's getting long. He's putting on some pounds. Like it's just, uh, it's crazy. But it's it's nice to know that I can you know, kind of help this little human grow up to be a decent human being and get him set up for life and be the father that uh, I didn't really have. So I'm excited for that. Um, I did want to ask you uh, what, I guess, uh, as far as your kids, because you have two kids? Three. Three, okay. Um, two sons and a daughter or two daughters and a son? Uh, oldest is the daughter and then two sons. Um, what are your, what are your um, proudest, uh, I guess, like, what are you most proud of as far as their accomplishments, maybe? Or just anything they've... What makes you most proud about well, your kids? Well, you know, seeing things on the news, and when, when I talk to some friends who have kids that struggle with, you know, personal problems, friendship problems, you know... Life and... Life problems, drugs, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Thank goodness my kids, <laughs> at least to my knowledge... <laughs> Up to this true. point... <laughs> Have not gotten, you know, have not succumbed to, to sort of the temptations that can lead you down a path that yes. is less than productive many times. They're smart. Yeah. Um, I think they're they're very independent. I mean, yeah. my daughter, who's what thirty four, okay, um, has more than once traveled around the world on her own. Nice. Just, you know, take off a year or six months or six weeks. And just buy a plane ticket and and figure it out. Good for her. Yeah, it causes a little stress with mom and dad, but you know. I'm sure with, with Skype from the beach and where in are Thailand, you? Yeah, How are you? <laughs> what and where? So <laughs> crickets. Very proud. You know, I, I went and, and voted yesterday in yeah. in the neighborhood, and I'm standing in line behind this woman in front of me, chatting briefly, and and out comes my son from the voting. from the voting polling place. Good job, sir. And I haven't seen him in, you know, six weeks, whatever. I know he's quit his job, uh, working for some big shot, looking for another job. But, you know, he lives in Alhambra, drove all the way over to the Palisades to, to, mm -hmm. to vote in this election. And, oh, wow. And went and, and hung out with mom for a while. I, I got mm -hmm. caught up with, with, uh, with school last night, so I didn't see him much. But, mm -hmm. and then, uh, and he's a music, uh, Artist, creative. Yeah, you mentioned he's the one in he's like Netherlands or somewhere off the charts in terms of his creative potential, but also, you know, extremely angst-driven because the problems of politics, the problems of life, the injustices and 
so forth drives him more crazy than it does the average person. Although I'm yeah. sitting there yelling at the, the TV last night, I guess, to my wife says, you wonder where he gets it, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just a reflection. Your best and worst closer. qualities. That's what they say, your best and worst, they, the kids, they get and, that. And then my youngest, who's what, the tallest six foot seven, Michael, he, he's... Uh, Tall. He's off the charts uh, smart. Mm -hmm. uh, went to, to Oberlin mm -hmm. for a couple of years. Didn't really like that, although he did that, that episode we had out at the Home Depot with uh, mm -hmm. Danny DeVito. His son was at the school at the time. Yes. His son was. They got to know each other. Oh. And uh, he didn't stay there because it's in the middle of nowhere. And mm -hmm. he went to UC Berkeley after that in film studies or something uh, related and did well there, graduated a little early, and then uh, his girlfriend was at Harvard. He applied to Harvard and MIT and went to MIT. So he's doing a little more technical... So he, uh, well, it was computer. urban planning. Urban planning? Urban planning. Okay. So he went to... But urban planning with, with media development as a photographer and a video editor from oh, the faculty wow. who was doing little short things, not, not unlike what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, applied for a Fulbright, and got a Fulbright scholarship to Mexico City for the next year. Then after Mexico City, went to Zurich and worked for a, a production company. He hasn't been home in the United States in five years. He took off with the career, and he just he never turned back. So now he works for. Uh, in fact, I mentioned I was talking to the dean here, Mitch, uh, in his office a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, and this lady who's been recently hired to run the galleries around here. She mm -hmm. was in the lobby at the same time, and 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 this artist um, Olafur Eliasson. Mm -hmm. He's a Danish artist. This yes. is the employer of my son. Yes. He has 90 employees, this artist who works in Berlin. Yeah. Okay, so this is the one you mentioned. Yeah. He, he, he does big design. installation, kind of, you know, major art scale pieces. art. Okay. And, and my son Michael is part of the documentary team oh, that works with him. Oh, because he went for the film studies yeah, exactly. and he did the urban planning document. Yeah, okay. So that buildings, I mean, he comes to Los Angeles and interviews Frank Gehry and the architects behind yeah, wow. projects around including the big airport expansion over at the International Terminal. So, look, I, I couldn't be more proud. Of, That's a lot to be proud of. They've, they've succeeded and and uh, and seem to be happy. And yeah, my middle son Christopher now has announced that he and his girlfriend are engaged to be married, and they actually have a date. So there's you know next summer we'll have be excited a marriage about. in the family. And you know, well, I'll, a lot of my friends are. Her grandpa, I'm not yet, so mm -hmm. we'll see if that wow. plays into things. But yeah, they've 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 done well. There's a, I think, a sense of, of appreciation of what what dad had managed to accomplish along the way. But a, a you know an equivalent or at least a hesitation to to acknowledge a lot of that. <laughs> They're like, I did this myself. <laughs> well, it's, 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 you know, it, it plays in. My yeah. daughter went to fine art school, right? She uh -huh. went up to UC Santa Cruz and studied fine art, printmaking, and and, uh, your wife, or no, my my daughter. Oh, your daughter's studying. So, and now you know, at the end of that, what do I do now? You got a degree in fine art. What are you going to do? She wants to live in San Francisco. I said, we'll come home for the summertime, and we'll teach you digital media. Mm -hmm. Make a DVD, make a video, make yeah. a whatever. Oh. So she did, and now she's one of the lead uh, user interface designers at, at uh, Trulia in the Bay Area. Mm. Does really well, which is, means she can afford to to take six months off and and travel, you know, to Bogota and. Morocco and places like that, and still do her job. She does this remotely. Jeez. So you and your wife are definitely proud. Yeah, it works out real well. I mean, I, I wish they were a little closer to home and, and, mm -hmm. and more in touch, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's their lives, and, and, mm -hmm. and figure it out. So, um, I guess, bad. yeah, no, it sounds good. I can only hope my, my son does, moves on to do great things, and, you know. <laughs> well, great things are, are by their own measure, too. Yes. You know? uh, there isn't a competition, hopefully, between the kids, although I know they, they recognize, well, you know, Michael's got all this accolades and living overseas, and I'm, you know, living on the east side above a, an apartment of people making too much noise for the other son. <laughs> but, you know, he'll figure that out, too, because he's got talents that are unique to him. Yes. Um, and, and he needs to learn how to open up some doors with, with a little more calmness in, in the attitude. But, yeah. you know, whatever. It's Nobody told me what to do. No. And, and I miss the fact that there wasn't, mom or dad to say, okay, great, I'm really proud of you, you know, you're, you're doing well in school. Back. Yeah, it's nice to have that kind of yeah. stuff. But what do you do? You just keep moving forward. Moving forward. Um, how, did you, uh, how, did, how did you meet your wife? So she's this is my second wife. Okay. So the first wife split after we got to California for a year yeah. or so, you know, that, that ultimately didn't work out. Okay. Um, and 
that was probably the, the, the manic period where you go through school to keep yourself, mm -hmm. you know, your brain busy and, and yeah. not fall into any kind of hole. And, uh, and I went through music school. One of my students in my electronic music class, um, Bill, had uh, his lady friend from Up With People, you know, had known my wife now, Mona, her name's Mona, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so she said, I know this woman who's just gotten divorced, my wife's divorced as well, was divorced at, as well, and mm -hmm. she's out, she was a student with me out at, at uh, Tempe in University of Arizona. Mm -hmm. She came into town, we, Bill and Kathy and I played in a, in a band, okay. it was a casual band here in town, okay. played once a month for some uh, students in, in North Hollywood, band days. Burbank, Burbank. And, and Mona came into town one weekend. Oh. And we were rehearsing, and she plays keyboards and sings, so she joined yeah. the band for the weekend. Mm -hmm. and I said, this woman is interesting. Mm -hmm. She's musical. She's attractive. She's, you know, she's from the Middle West, Midwest, from Iowa. Oh. It sort of appreciates the sens uh, sensibilities that, that came with that part of the world where I grew up as well, yeah, and nearby. Be, yeah. And uh, we hit it off. We started going to concerts together. And, nice. And she lived in, in Montecito at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you you got to be pretty desperate to drive 100 miles for a date and come back, but, but I certainly did and appreciate it. It worked out great. We've been married 36 years now. So, yeah. Yay! <laughs> so, yeah. I, I got no complaints. It's, it's, uh, and she's a dog lover, too, so oh. Charlie gets plenty of attention. Yeah, Charlie's her. like, I vote yay to Mona. She stays. If yeah. Charlie says you stay, Mona, you stay. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um... But it's not over yet, you know. The, the yeah. fact is, things keep going. Who, who's a better singer, you or Mona? Oh, Mona. If you go to, go to the website and download, I, I uploaded some of the stuff that she did uh, on uh, on some audition tapes, and, and she's extremely talented. But you know, what do you do? You know, at the end of yeah. of studying and with Marshall Singer at the Music Academy of the West yeah. and so forth, you know, then you you your life changes dramatically when you have three kids in four years. You know. Yeah. Um, geez, yeah, it definitely does. I mean, my life's changing with one kid. I can only imagine, you know, he got a few more. In well, she there. traded out, and, and it's you know, it's it's a it's a frustrating thing to say. Okay, great, where are your priorities and what yeah. your ambitions are? But you know, she was she was a primary homemaker that took care of the kids while I was working seven days a week you in were, the studio. You were working. You were definitely uh, working. Um, would you? Uh, this might be a dumb question, especially after everything um, we've talked about. Would you hire your younger self? Depending on... <laughs> I would, absolutely. Okay, and you definitely would hire your present self, because, hey, Dr. AIX. Yeah, well, yeah, I would, but... but the, yeah, I would. Okay. I'm honest, <clears throat> I'm, I'm capable, I'm not the, the sharpest tool in the, in the shed, but I'm, I, will, I will find out what it takes to, to overcome, you know, a problem, solve that problem, mm -hmm. most likely, and, and be able to present, you know, whatever it is that's, that's being challenged. I'm, you know, I'm... I'm I'm trying to figure out how to, to, to remodel my house. Mm -hmm. I don't want to pay some architect five thousand dollars to to, hey. to do an as drawn of my building. I bought an eighty dollar measure the wall, you know, laser pointer from across the room. You did start and ta all the taught myself, you know, yeah, taught yeah. myself, um, you know, uh, AutoCAD and 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 uh -oh. uh, Revit and any of these programs. It's so expand the portfolio. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> it's something else to do again. Life is one of those continuing learning opportunities, and you know if somebody says it's going to cost you twenty five hundred, five thousand dollars to you're do like, an ASPR uh... on your house, and you're going to use what software? Oh, thank Revit. you. I'm going to use Revit. <laughs> well, let me take a look and get back to you. So you, then you run Revit on your computer, and mm -hmm. the next thing you know, I got a three D model of my house. Jeez, I might need to tap into that. Um, and so, obviously, those are you've. I, I feel like you've answered a lot of that, but is there anything additional that you think would define a successful audio engineer? Any additional qualities? You know, I, I say in the classes that it's like you, you certainly got to know how to turn on the motor and you know and <laughs> do all the signal flow stuff and yeah. be able to solve problems for people. That's not where people get hired back. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of wonderful, competent engineers who can who can mix, and master, and and learn EQ and, mm -hmm. and what all the gear does and what all the plugins are about. What people really come back for over and over and over again is because they enjoy working with you. Enjoy your presence. They know they're going to get things done. That's that's the professional technical part of it. But it's fun. Yeah. You got to be there with these people every day. If it's a drag, if there's tension, if there's a bunch of nonsense going on in the room, 
that's not fun. It's not yeah. fun for them. It's not fun for you. So even and and you know some of my customers may see this and wonder. There are customers of mine, clients that I've had in the past, I couldn't stand. Mm -hmm. They're really not people I want to be around and I have a great yeah. deal of respect for or otherwise, but they don't know that. Yeah. Because, because <laughs> you don't while, know that. while I'm working with them, it's, it's you know. Easy going, easy sailing. Best buds, you know. <laughs> um, what? Uh, so attitude has a lot to do with it because, you know, if you want to do this for 40 years, yeah. it better be fun. Yeah, no, I, I always say that definitely more than like having the skills for the job because I mean you can get beat out just on nepotism alone to somebody giving it to who they know, but they definitely, definitely need to like you. Because if people don't like you, right. they're not going to hire you. Why, why is it? They don't want to be around you. are back. They don't want to pick up your calls, any of that. Um, uh, what, what will your legacy be and, you know, does that matter? I don't know if it matters a whole lot. Mm -hmm. I am proud of the fact that, that generally out there, even with this, this campaign that I'm, I'm involved with, with the soundbar right now. The Kickstarter is, and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's gotten ugly because they aren't delivering the speakers, and, and I vouched for it. You know, it's a lot of my goodwill and, and, and uh, reputation, reputation was on the line. Yes. And, and, and it's, it's reassuring to know that those people that, that do respond on these comments say, Mark is a good guy. You know, he's, he's, he's not a shyster. Uh, they'll vouch for me, basically. There's a testimonial knowing that, that he's trying to do the right thing, and I am in this case. Yeah. I really want those people to get the speakers that they deserve, um, and I'll figure out a way to, to try and make that happen if I at all possibly can. Uh, my little corner of audiophiledom yeah. is, is not insubstantial. Mm -hmm. Most of the people in the, the business, or at least a, a fair number of them, are aware of what I've done, who I am, the okay. book that I wrote. Um, the products that I've made, the panels that I've been on, the, you know, the, uh, the contribution I've made to, to high-end audio, and the honesty that I've actually confronted, the even recognition that, that maybe what I've spent my life and millions of dollars doing for the last 20 years doesn't really matter that much. That maybe <laughs> CDs are enough. Maybe, you know, maybe, um, because if I can't tell the difference between a CD and, and a high-res version of mine, then I'm a good guy because I'm honest enough to recognize that, but yeah. I feel like a bit of a schlub because I've spent 10 years... 15, 20 years doing it for maybe nothing. So, look, I, I carved out a little niche in, in audio mm -hmm. album, um, and, and the degree of recognition that I've got is within that world yes. reasonable enough, but I'm not a Grammy-winning, Grammy-nominated, you know, uh, member of the larger audio, file, or audio engineering community for commercial and rock and urban rap country, whatever and, you've got. But you might be friends with him, so maybe some of that... Oh, I'm very good run. friends with a lot of those people. I believe Ken Calais is a very good friend of mine, and he, he was responsible for rumors in Fleetwood Mac. Wow. Um, let's see. Um, what, is there... Uh, what, are, what are you... Actually, there's two more questions I want to ask you. You got time for two more? We got five minutes. Five minutes? So, okay, I'll just ask this one then. What are you... And we'll end with that. What are you afraid of? Boy, that's a tough one. You know, in all honesty, I think uh, I'm afraid, you know, as I look up on the wall and see my 20-year service award here at the university. Nice. I am, am disturbed, worried, concerned that the program that I've invested 20-plus years in is, is sort of tearing and shredding at the edges, that there isn't a, a, a sense of forward-looking, you know, uh, leadership in terms of the, the, the program that I've invested so much of my life in. And that's unfortunate. I mean, it's, it's not something I can, I can control, mm -hmm. but I know that things used to be a whole lot better and that the education that people got as they left here was a whole lot better. Okay. Um, and, and, and that concerns me. Mm -hmm. Look, it's not, and I, for the longest time, pushed hard, mm -hmm. but there was, there was an equal and opposite push back, so, mm -hmm. so that hasn't been able to, to, to change. And I'm close enough to the end of my career here, mm -hmm. you know, another three, four, five years, whatever, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I'll be leaving and mm -hmm. who knows what's going to happen to the department. Maybe it collapses and, and gets assumed into calm and music or something else, mm -hmm. um, which would be disappointing to me after investing this much time in, in my career to try and build something I'm proud of. I stick around because I'm very pleased with the students that we've got, certainly yes. that group of students that is motivated and turned on by the, the opportunity to study with people like me and others in the department. Yes. Um, 
but there's no guarantee that you know that that will sustain itself after I'm, after I'm gone. There aren't, you know, there's a certain amount of pressure on academia to, to hire PhDs. Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of PhD audio engineers. No. You know, huh? if you're out there doing it, you're out there doing you're it. You're doing it. You're not worried about getting a PhD. So you know this academic versus professional thing is is kind of a dichotomy that can't can't coexist. Mm -hmm. I'm in a very unusual animal in that instance that I have a have and have had a very active professional career, but also I'm willing to dedicate the time and be a part of a community like the institution we have here. Yeah. So you know that's a that's a stressor. It's kind of a new mm -hmm. thing, but um, I haven't thrown up my hands yet. But you know it's kind of in a static stasis mode in terms of the way the program is is handled and run and how the students interact with it. Uh -huh. I think the students know what's going on. Yeah, and I think uh, we have a lot of students in our program that are wanting to make the program better and like do stuff like I know um, like buy equipment for you know the different studios we have I know Taylor wants to do that I know I almost want to leave some equipment donate equipment maybe even like video equipment and stuff mm -hmm. possibly for my own money and just so they have it access to because we don't have access to the TV film student stuff um, and you know yeah it's too bad you never know when the you know what our interests are going to draw us into, but um, also I know Slade, for instance, one of our students was interested in getting a group of us together to clean the SSL, one of the studios, and just make it look better and more presentable. So I think um, you might be surprised by some of the stuff students are willing to do, and maybe, who knows, maybe come back and teach or something. You know, I'm, I'm actually uh, kind of considering or on the pathway to pursuing a master's after this, so maybe I can, you know, come back and teach sure. something. I don't know, but um, I do want to thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. It's I want to thank you. Thank the honorable <laughs> and legendary Dr. AX, but I mean, it might be Mark uh, DIY Waldrip. <laughs> Signal Flow Waldrip. Signal Flow Waldrip, okay, whatever works. Um, but I want to really thank you for coming on, you know, sharing your story, uh, talking to me, giving, you know, potentially some, you know, some insight to not only myself but you know students in the program and maybe other people out there when they see this sure um you know to just keep moving forward obviously you know always always keep moving forward um so uh that's the end of our episode uh 23 black air and broadcast stay tuned stay blessed don't stress bye bye it's the black air and broadcast